Last week saw one of the biggest exercises in electoral politics in Britain this year, with local elections across England and Northern Ireland. The other, of course, being European elections set to take place later this month. The number of seats up for grabs was more than 8,500, many, many seats. And the last time these precise seats were contested was in 2015's local elections. They took place on the same night as that year's general election, which meant they had an unnaturally high turnout and that we could presume all things being equal that certain things would happen. One was that the Conservatives would lose councillors because, of course, in 2015, David Cameron defied all the odds to form a majority at Westminster. Another was that Liberal Democrats would bounce back somewhat. Again, in 2015, they were punished by the electorate for being in the coalition government for five years. That was their nadir, or so we thought. And so you would expect them to win some council seats this time round. Conversely, with UKIP, their best ever general election result was, of course, in 2015. They won almost four million votes. And Obviously, as an outgrowth of that, they gained many councillors on the night of the 2015 local elections. So it was widely anticipated that they would lose councillors. At the same time, people generally presumed Labour would pick up councillors at the cost of the Conservatives. And that the Greens, because they'd done pretty well in 2015, would probably stay still. Now, some of that happened, some didn't. Uh, the Tories lost 1,330 councillors. That was more than they were expecting. They were trying to engage in expectations management by saying 500 would be neutral. What that tells us is that 1,330 is an utter catastrophe, even by what they were preparing the media for. And the Lib Dems, of course, won more than 700 councillors. The Greens as well, 194. The big story of the night for the media, though, was Labour's inability to gain from Tory defeat. And the prison, quite expectedly, was Brexit. Because of their inability to decide whether they were for or against a second referendum, they were being punished by the electorate, or so we were told. But I think that's only half the story. And while Labour did lose 80 councillors, if you look at where they lost them and where they gained them, things begin to look a bit more optimistic in regards to them forming the next government at Westminster. Here's an image of the councils where they lost the most councillors. As you can see, they're overwhelmingly in northern safe seats which voted leave. Now, they won't stay safe forever. I'll talk about that later. But it's fair to say that most of them will be Labour come the next general election. And where do they make gains? Well, those were in marginals, generally speaking, in the South East, some in the Midlands as well. So while Labour suffered in Barnsley, Bolsover and Sunderland, they gained seats in Folkestone, in Worthing, in Rother. So where are these places? Rother includes Hastings and Rye, Amber Rudd's constituency. It's a key Labour target seat. Elsewhere you had Johnny Mercer in Plymouth. Plymouth, of course, saw Labour gain one councillor. Then you've got Broxtow, formerly the seat of Anna Subri MP as a Conservative. Now, of course, her seat as a MP for Change UK. Labour did well there. Uh, and in Mansfield, they won the mayor's race for the town. In Swindon, they lost a councillor, but their share of the vote went up by 8%. And then we look at other places, uh, Sherwood, South Thanet. There's a really interesting story to tell, as I say, generally in the uh, southeast, but across the south and some of the Midlands too. You've also got uh, Amber Valley. So in terms of forming a government, in terms of being the largest party after the next general election, if not forming a majority government, these were a pretty decent set of results for Labour. Now, what do they mean for the Liberal Democrats? Of course, at face value, winning more than 700 councillors can only be good news. But when you dig a bit deeper and look at their share of the vote, it's not perhaps as good as one might initially suspect. They won 19% of the vote, uh, less than both the Tories and Labour. But what's interesting is that that's only a percentage point more than what they won in the 2017 local elections. And as history tells us, they were only a little over a month before the 2017 general election where their share of the vote actually went down on 2015. So in and of itself, these local elections shouldn't be much of a guide for the prospects of a Lib Dem hashtag fight back. But if we situate them within a broader historic context, things get even more interesting. Between 1997 and 2010, the Liberal Democrats averaged around 25-26% in local elections. So even four years out from being punished by the electorate for being in that coalition government and with the rocket fuel of Brexit, they're still not going back to that historic trend. 
That means, I suspect, that they will never will. And a major reason why is the Green Party. As I've said, the Greens won 194 new councillors. Doubly impressive, given their results in 2015 were good, because it was on the same night as the general election where they did very well. Now, historically, or at least between the late 1980s and 2010, basically almost all of my life, if you weren't going to vote Labour or Conservative, you would vote Liberal Democrat, which is why in local elections they tended to do very well. In 2003, in fact, just a few months after Britain invaded Iraq, the Liberal Democrats got 30% in local elections results. So they're only marginally above half that now. And that, like I say, is with Brexit, arguably the biggest constitutional question of my life. What the Greens now seemingly change in all of this is that the Liberal Democrats are no longer the default neither of the big two party. It seems that many voters, whether it be around left wing issues, anger, austerity or wishing to remain in the European Union, no longer look at the Liberal Democrats as the default. Actually, considerably large numbers think that the Greens are where they wish to go. Now, if the Liberal Democrats want to win 20, 30 seats at the next general election, go back to what they view as their historical norm for the late 1990s and much of the 2000s, they'll have to stop that from happening because, as it seems to me, the Greens in places like the South West, where the Liberal Democrats want to win back Tory seats, maybe will stop them getting over the line. And like I say, I don't think that's going to turn around anytime soon because it's not just Brexit which is powering the rise of the Green Party, it's climate change too. And as we've seen with Extinction Rebellion and Parliament passing emergency uh, legislation to call a climate crisis, that will only be a bigger issue over time. And I think the Greens will benefit primarily at the cost of the Liberal Democrats when it comes to local elections. Then we've got the Conservatives. In any year, losing 1,330 councillors would be bad news. But I think even those numbers don't quite tell you how bad a story it is. A Tory seeking to defend those results might point to 1995, when John Major's Tories lost 2,000 councillors, two years ahead of Labour's momentous 1997 general election victory. 2,000. That's bigger than 1,300, sure. But there's something else going on here as well. The Conservatives are losing places they've never really lost before. So in Bournemouth, for instance, where I grew up, Bournemouth Paul and Christchurch, until last week, 51 of its 54 councillors were Tories. Now it's moved into no overall control. That means they're not just confronting the Labour Party or the Liberal Democrats, but also the Greens and independents too. That is to say, a significant part of their historic base former Conservative activists and voters are moving away from them because of Brexit. They're being pincered from both the left, primarily on austerity, on Brexit, on falling living standards, but also from their right. That's going to be a very difficult challenge for them to address. There's a similar story in a bunch of other councils. You had, of course, Trafford Council won by Labour. But what I find really interesting is the places where Labour were just beginning to break through. So, for instance, in... Um, Waverley Council, which includes Jeremy Hunt's constituency, two uh, Labour councillors were elected uh, to Godalming. These aren't places historically where Labour councillors win. Uh, similar story in Chichester. Labour picked up a couple of councillors there. Uh, they picked up, I think, one or two councillors in Guildford. Now, I'm not saying that these are going to be Labour targets anytime soon, but what I think is happening there is a slow motion version of what's happening in places like Chingford. Currently, home to Ian Duncan Smith, Tory MP, a target for Labour, and Pfizer Shaheen. Labour are looking to win those seats because of people leaving London, because of growing BAME communities, because of young people there, maybe university educated, not feeling they have real prospects in the area, can't afford to buy the kinds of homes that their parents raise them in. There are similar trends happening in places like Guildford, uh, places like Chichester, albeit far more slowly and far less intensely. But what it does mean, if not in the next general election in 10, 15 years time, is that the Conservatives are going to have very few safe seats left. Now, I view that as the third variable amongst three, a triptych of variables that really seem to me as posing an existential challenge to the Conservative Party. The first is, of course, their membership. It's getting older, it's shrinking. The same is, of course, true for their electorate. But in a age of populist people-powered politics, having a small, 
older membership is difficult. Secondly, their bastion of media power has historically been in the print media. That, of course, is declining. You only need to look at the sales of the Sun newspaper and the Daily Mail to know as much. And, of course, some of that power is reproduced in their online output and it's amplified by broadcast, particularly the BBC, but it's clearly not going to win elections like some claim it did in 1992 when the Sun had the iconic front page. It was the Sun what won it. Thirdly, is this third variable. I think it's as big as the other two, if not bigger, of there not really being, because of long-term sociological shifts, that many safe seats in the South in particular. Now, I've said that Labour had a surprisingly good election. I think it's interesting how the media is failing to report some really big and positive stories for them, and also how the Tories seem to be in free fall to a greater extent than even the numbers show. But there are obviously some bad stories for Labour as well. Four years into the Corbyn project, it still doesn't have much of a vision for locally based municipal socialism. Yes, there's the Preston model, and that really should be at the forefront of the public conversation far more than it is. But generally speaking, Labour, and particularly Corbynism's theory of change, is winning power at Westminster and using the national centralised state to affect socialism. I don't think that will work. It's useful, and it, as I've said, is increasingly likely, but in isolation, it's insufficient. A good place to look here by comparison is perhaps Barack Obama's United States. Obama, of course, won his first presidency in 2008, his second in 2012. That decade, or eight years, was presumed by many to mark a shift in American public life, changing public attitudes around same-sex marriage, abortion, uh, narcotics, drugs, even foreign policy. And yet Donald Trump wins in 2016. A major reason why is that the Democrats got high off their own propaganda, fundamentally. They had executive power, but they didn't control the House, the Congress. At the same time, the Democratic Party was being hollowed out across the country at a local level. And Corbynism cannot work if the Labour Party just has a small majority in the Houses of Parliament, in the House of Commons. It can't work. It will need a very large majority simply by virtue of resistance from within the party because the establishment runs as much through Labour as through anything else. But also it will need to have examples of how to create 21st century socialism at the local level which offer prototypes for elsewhere, much like how the NHS was based on uh, public insurance programmes amongst miners in Wales. So I think uh, a Corbynism without a local aspect will inevitably fail. And as I've said, what these local election results tell us is that four years into Corbynism, we still don't really have a model of what 21st century local socialism looks and feels like. An addendum to that is seats like Barnsley, Sunderland, Bolsover. And as I've said, these aren't going to not be Labour at the next election. Bolsover is quite close, but generally speaking, they're safe Labour seats. Uh, and yes, they skew the picture a bit in terms of national performances time round, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about them. Uh, Craig Jenner wrote a great piece for Navarro Media about Barnsley, uh, and I agreed with much of what it said. We need to win these places over on the left by transforming their economies, by flooding money into public services, transforming high streets, transforming ownership, of course, all of these things. But as much as an economic offer, they also need a social and political offer and where they sit and fit in 21st century Britain. This is a country which has had an over-centralised tendency now for centuries and London plays an ever larger part in the national conversation and the popular psyche but that's increasingly dissonant from the everyday lived experiences of tens of millions of people and that's something which often goes over the head of commentators based in London. So I think Labour needs a vision for municipal socialism and it still hasn't got one and I also think it needs to create a story for places which might be referred to as its historic heartlands which is very much a modern one, which isn't nostalgic and which is optimistic about a better tomorrow. The good news is I think the Tories really are facing annihilation. At the next general election, they might lose big, they might lose small. But as I've said, the longer term shifts in regard to print media, in regards to voter demographics, and as we've seen last week, in regard to an ever shrinking cluster of safe seats, doesn't bode well for one of the most successful political parties in modern European history. So conclusion is this, mixed bag for Labour, but far more positive than the media is saying, particularly if we want to look at who's going to form the next government. 
At the same time, it's clear that one of the biggest challenges Labour faces is building a compelling vision of 21st century socialism at a local level, and one that is also culturally resonant with places which aren't London and which aren't in the South East.